My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have Devin Levake. Devin is founder and CEO of Don't Be a Pig Wellness Company, serving New York City, Brooklyn, Jersey City, Hoboken, and Bergen County areas. Devin is a personal trainer that focuses on specific body weight movements tailored specifically to your own body type. He takes training to the next level and has several different coaches on his team to help fit all your personal fitness and nutrition needs. He also has an amazing story on how he got to where he is at today. He is always posting new workouts and fitness programs on Instagram, so feel free to check him out and give him a follow after this episode. Please welcome Devin Levake. Yeah, man. Thanks for the intro. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, Dev, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Woke up early. I was up in Central Park this morning training some people. A little outside workouts in the cold? Yeah. No, it's actually at the one hotel Central Park at that location. So, okay. yeah, we're, we offer you know one-on-one training at the hotels now in Central Park, Brooklyn. And then down in Miami, we we have Anatomy Gym, which is not mine. It's Mark Megna's. Um, and he has some awesome trainers down there. So, they're handling the one-on-one training down there. But yeah, all the one hotels now offer one-on-one training, which is really cool. Beautiful. And Dev, so before we get into that, uh, where are you from originally? I was born in Idaho. I then lived there until I was maybe like four or five. Remember yeah. it. A bit. And then my father was a building developer. And like, uh-huh. developer, so it was like a big boom in Idaho. So we, we went out and I guess he built out there and then came back to New Hampshire where he's from. And, you know, my mom's from New England as well. So nice out here and he continued his shop out here. So, and what was like life growing up like in New Hampshire? You uh, like it? Yeah. I grew up on about 46 acres in a, in a yeah, pretty large house. My dad was about go big or go home. And so I actually grew up with, you know, about a 2000 square foot gym in my house. He was pretty into wellness and health and vitamins and what to take and eating healthy. So Kind of rubbed off on you? Yeah, yeah. It kind of just fell on me. You know, I've been doing, you know, working out since I was a kid. So that was cool. My mom was into it as well. So I grew up in New Hampshire, about 46 acres and pretty big house. I had four sisters. So that was cool. And I was not really allowed to play video games. Why is that? I don't know. I I, I think they thought I started playing Grand Theft Auto when I was like really young and I played it a couple of times. And like, I kind of made the decision. I was like, I don't really want to play this. I felt... I don't know. I felt like weird, just like going around killing people. <laughs> and I was like, I, I probably shouldn't play this. Like, like my mental state was just like, it was like, this is weird. And so that was like the first and last game I played. And then um, I you spend you know, all your time outside after that. All outside. You know, we were a big believer in like having fun outside and activities. So four wheeling, snowmobiling in New Hampshire. I was on the trampoline constantly. I got into skateboarding. I went through that whole phase. Snowboarding. Uh, so- snowboarding. I mean, instead of gym class during the winter, you know, our middle school would take us to the mountains. So I grew up, you know, snowboarding my whole life. And then, and then, yeah, the trampoline and mountain biking. and You're you're always doing flips and all this crazy stuff. So you were doing that at a young age. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we also had about seven horses more for just pleasure and stuff. So I was riding horses, flipping, you know, my boys would come over and we would just figure out like what, nonsense to get into outside you know absolutely yeah so when did sports come into play i started the first sport i played was baseball around maybe six years old i didn't really know what i was doing obviously yeah. then that kind of kicked off and i became pretty good at baseball and you know pitching and shortstop and then once i got older i moved to center and left field throughout high school but that was the first sport i played and then i played football basketball and baseball from, I don't know, I want to say maybe eight years old all the way until I was 18. I would play three seasons every year. So, And what did you want? Did you want to pursue any of those after high school? Basketball is my favorite sport to play for sure. 
baseball was cool because it gave me a little downtime and it wasn't as like hardcore, but it was a, yeah. it was a good vibe. I liked it. You know, it wasn't yeah. the people that surround you in a baseball setting are super cool. So that was good. And then football is just, you get pumped for it during the summer, you know, it's warm. And then by Absolutely. the end of the year, I'm kind of sick of football just because it's yeah. cold and no good. Yeah. So actually going into the military academy, I didn't know if I was going to totally pursue sports after high school or, but yeah. one thing led to another. And I think I bloomed at a little later age and towards when I was maybe 17, 18, I actually repeated my junior year and I became decently well and above others at sports. And I was just excelling fast at it. So it kind of came upon me that colleges were reaching out and scholarships. And I ended up winning a prep school national championship my senior year for football, which was really cool. And then baseball broke the batting school record. I hit like 689 out of high school. Yeah. So that was really good. What uh, was life like at the uh, military academy? Do you think that did some uh, good for you? Yeah. I didn't really want to go to the military academy per se, but I kind of got sent there. And <laughs> it was probably one of the best things that happened to me. It wasn't, I was like a totally bad kid, but it was definitely uh, to get my mind right. And I was definitely distracted in New Hampshire, not with drugs or anything, just, you know, didn't know where I wanted to go with it. And so absolutely. When I went well, you're there. definitely, you're a high energy person just naturally. Yeah. And I think if you got too many things in front of you, it could be a little distracting. So that probably helped you focus that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So that was really good. And it just shows you structure and attention to detail and when to talk and when not to talk. You know? <laughs> and so that was really good. And you're surrounded by a bunch of guys for two years nonstop, except for summer months. And you kind of learn different personalities and culture because it wasn't just Americans that were there. It was people from Russia, China, Japan, every state you can imagine, Mexico. It was kids from all over the world that were mm -hmm. kind of sent to the school to, I guess, somewhat the same reason. I would say about a third of the kids were there for bad behavior, a third of the kids that were for their first sports, and a third were just these rich little kids or their parents, you know, didn't want to deal with them. So that guy, <laughs> the tuition there was, I want to say, 60 grand a year. So, I mean, it wasn't a cheap school to go to. Definitely. And so what happened after the military academy? Did you go to college after that? Yeah. So I received some offers from different schools. No school would really let me play one or the other sport. And so I decided to go to Division two, and I went to Long Island University on a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, and what sport? Football. And the coach was like, hey, you know, you can play baseball a couple of years down the line, but they didn't want to start me off at playing both. And so mm -hmm. we'll get into that. But yeah, I started just playing football. And actually, our mutual friend, Smitty, is the one that picked me up for my official visit. And that's a first Jesus. time. How of a character to pick you up on an official oh. visit. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it was a really good first, first impression of the, of the um, school. And, you know, we, we did some, we were running around, you know, weight training this, I threw a back flip here and there. They're like, all right, cool. Then they called me the next day and like, yo, we're, you're in. I you're in. Like, so I liked it. And, you know, I was thinking New York, I didn't really want to go back to New Hampshire. New Hampshire wasn't, I kind of saw, especially at the military academy, like Philadelphia. I mean, not my favorite city, but I saw the city life a little bit. And it's not yeah. the middle of nowhere. It could have definitely been worse. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then I was like, all right, Long Island University, it's close to the city. I actually didn't even go to New York City that much when I was in Long Island, I stayed around there. But you understand more of the city life than I would have knew in New Hampshire. So it was definitely Absolutely. It was a good choice. And how did your football career go over there? It went pretty well. I started off, I've always had somewhat of a, tough time understanding playbook. I just, I wasn't, I don't want to like say video games help, but I feel that people that played like Madden growing up mm -hmm. understand, you know, the formations much easier because they're looking at it. Me, I, didn't play it. I was First just like, view. I was like, I'm just going to be an athlete and go in yeah. and, and just do my thing. I never, yeah. I never really understood like the formations and why we're doing this. I was more like, yo, I'm just going to cover this kid. You're going to sprint around, get open and catch the ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I played corner there. So I was just, I was all about, they taught you a little technique, but at the end of the day, I think it's all about athletic ability. And mm -hmm. it kind of took me to college. So I kind of just did my thing. Like I said, I was at a military academy before. So getting surrounded by a bunch of bars and nightclubs in that scene, you know, I was curious, I got to check it out. I haven't you know, for two years, yeah. And girls were somewhat in the picture, but I mean, for the most part, you're surrounded by guys in the military. Kind of thing. <laughs> fun. Right. And so I started going out a little bit, but I, so I was doing well starting and then we had this big game coming up and I actually went out the night before the game. Didn't really like drink too much. I just like went out to the city to this like day glow party, I think it was called. And 
everyone was like, oh, don't go. Like the captain of the team's like, Devin, you can't go. And I was like, well, I'm going. And so I ended up going. I was just not following rules. And I go in and someone definitely told on me and <laughs> brought me up to his office. was like, what's going on? And I was like, nothing. And he's like, what's the wristband that you have on? I was like, you left the wristband on? <laughs> And he's like, he's like, all right, you're suspended for four games. Um, you got to get out of the facility and you know, we'll talk tomorrow. And so it wasn't actually that bad. You know, like he, he gets it. And so I yeah. kind of went back and I think that was freshman year. And then sophomore year, I had a decent year. And then junior year is kind of when I saw what was going on in the whole sports world. And when mm-hmm. I say that, I say that just because... I see so many people go to college and they have no clue kind of what they want to do. And I'm on the side, you know, promoting at these nightclubs, uh, bartending, um, you know, pretty much helping them run it and making pretty decent money, you know? And I was Absolutely. like, I would make the money and then I would take everyone out. Hey guys, dinner's on me, drinks are on me, you know, mm-hmm. to all my boys. And I'm like, I mean, in a sense, I'm like, why? I kind of have it figured out to the most part, as I thought I wasn't going to get caught up in the whole, like, you play football in college and you assistant coach after that. And then right. like, I just didn't want to do that. I saw people do that and it was just like, wasn't a lifestyle I wanted. So yeah. I, kind of didn't, I didn't take football too seriously after that. I continued to work out, stay healthy, but football was kind of like, ah, I don't know if I, I don't know if that's the lifestyle for me. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, one thing led to another and you know, the coach is like, and the athletic director was basically gave me an ultimatum. Like either you stop and you refocus all your energy into football or, you know, we're going to take your scholarship away. And I was just like, peace. Yep. <laughs> Later. And at that point I had no zero clue on what I was going to do. I, mm-hmm. I was kind of in a position. I was like, but I'll figure it out. I don't care, but I'm not. So did that mean you have to, you had to leave the school because the scholarship was no, no longer. I didn't, I didn't have to, but, I mean, the pay. but yeah, exactly. So like yeah. I had a full scholarship, like tuition. I want to say at Long Island university was like, 50,000. So like in my head, I'm like, okay, like my mom definitely like, was it going to help? I just gave up the scholarship. Yeah. Like, my family's like, yo, we're not going to help you out now. Yeah. You know? And so at that point I was like, what school can I go to? That's not going to be like totally like a financial burden, but can still help my career somewhat if I want to still pursue, you know, school. And so I was searching around and I actually went to Hoboken, New Jersey with Smitty. Yeah. And I was, like, this is such a fun, like little town, you know? Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean, we've been out in Hoboken before. I mean, it's a fun town, especially at the age of like 20, 21. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I went out there once and then I was looking at colleges around there, you know? And that's kind of what you wanted to get into too, because you were promoting exactly. for the nightclubs. That's where it's at. Exactly. And so I went there and I was like, this, this is fun, you know? Like, yeah. this is great. And then there's Montclair. And you probably felt free too, for like yeah. the first time in a long time. Yeah, it was a burden when I stopped playing for Long Island University. It was it was definitely a burden off my chest. Like, okay, now what? But it was also like, now what? <laughs> you yeah. know? And so I went to Montclair State. I was like, I went to what's a Kane. You know, that was another close college. Didn't really wasn't my vibe. But then I went yeah. to Montclair and I was like, wow, this is a nice town. You know, the coach G was super cool. You know, he had a really good, you know, past history, you know, with winning and you know, he had connections to the NFL if I ever wanted to pursue that. You know, I know he sent guys there regardless if it's Division three or not. And so I go and I work out with the team and I start playing with them. And there's something between Division one, Division two, II, Division three. I've done all the workouts. And Division three, people are just slower, not as strong, and definitely not as driven. And I just noticed it right off the bat at our first workout when we're doing bench. And like normally, even at Long Island University, like you're going hard until like you physically can't lift the weight anymore. These Mm -hmm. guys five reps and be like, ah, I don't want to do it anymore. And like racking up, what like their mentality was just different. And that's and I want to say that's the difference between Division three, two, and one is like your mental drive to like how far you actually want to go with this. And so that's anything in life, really. Yeah, exactly. And so that's kind of what I saw in that. And so at that point, I didn't again, I didn't take it like too seriously. I was still looking for the next option and be a bartender at the W hotel in Hoboken. Yeah. And in, and the guy's like, this guy, Darren, he's like, I'm not going to make you a bartender. I actually want to take you under my wing and show you the business side and you're going to be a manager. I was like, okay, like, yeah. <laughs> like this is, you know, definitely the nicest hotel in Hoboken, definitely one of the top nightclubs in New Jersey in general. And, you know, I kind of just landed a really cool position. And so at that point I'm like, I'm a nightclub manager. I'm going to be a restaurant tour. Like that's my vision. That's where mm-hmm. I'm going. 
And then school kind of just faded away. I was like, I'm not going to some Greek class to learn this or, you know, psychology or whatever class. I was just like, it's not, it's not worth it for me right now. It's a waste of my time. I'm not learning anything. I'm I'm not making money doing this. Instead, I'm actually just getting myself in debt. It's not, Mm -hmm. it's not something that's working for me. So eventually I kind of just made, I played one season at Montclair. Again, didn't take it too seriously. I, I actually, you know, I was at a point where I wouldn't even take the bus to the game. I would just drive myself to the game. (laughs) Everyone would be like sleeping over in a hotel and I would just show up the next day at the game. And I was just, it wasn't about it. I was still performing, but it's not a good look. You know, I look back, it's not a good look. I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, It was kind of what I knew. Um, And then I just didn't return the next season to school or football. And then, you know, I I just... So then you went all in on the... uh... All in, all in. I was like, you know, this is it. This is where we're going to, you know, execute. I saw what Darren was doing. He was expanding, you know, the group we were with, you know, Eugene Rem, you know, they had catch finale, Brickwood, Lexington brass. They had a ton of places in the city. Those guys are expanding. I'm like, this is the industry I want to get in. I love it. The only problem is you're kind of, you're drinking every night, yeah. you're late night, you're out late. Yeah. Out late. I mean, I would get to work maybe seven to start opening the nightclub. And then we're there until like 4am, 5am. You know, what, making sure they're cleaning up properly, making sure the bartenders are counting their tips, you know, barbacks, busboys, making sure everything's clean and whatnot. Um, and like, it was cool. And I didn't think of health at that point. I was still working out. I've, yeah. No matter what, through this whole thing, I'm still going to the gym and working out. I've never been overweight. I've never, I don't think I could get overweight if I tried, but <laughs> like lost that. And so that's always in the back of my mind. And it never came to me to ever make that a career. But I was approached by a man in the hotel saying, Hey, do you want to uh, partner at the restaurant with me? And he had a restaurant over in Jersey city. I said, this could be a cool opportunity. I mean, after you're a general manager, the next step is to definitely become a partner. And I didn't know if I saw that, saw my next step at this venue to be a partner or the restaurant. And so it just kind of happened. It just happened. And so I was like, I'm going to take a leap again and see if I can help execute this next restaurant. And so I'm not going to name the name of it, but I ended up doing that and come to find out this partner was just a scheme ball. And he kind of just didn't have the right vision of a restaurant and he was running, you know, did you get a gut feeling about that? Like when you first met him? Oh, I I mean, not only did I have a gut feeling, but everyone in the town and the industry said, don't work with this guy. I'm like, no, it's different. It's different. This guy convinced me. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. Like I'm going to prove everyone wrong. No, whenever something's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. (laughs) Good to be true. And so I went through that, but I'm really glad I failed at that. Like when I was young, I I, yeah. wanted, I I signed the partnership agreement when I was 23. And I was like, I'm a partner at a restaurant. Like I'm 23 years old. Look what I've done. Cool. Yeah. But it's not all fun and games. It just wasn't, it wasn't good. But I learned uh, so much of what not to do and what to do and the burden you have when you're a partner, you know, financially. But at the same time, like things can come down on you more. So I ended up, taken away the partnership after a year and I left completely. And so... And then so you're back to you're back to square one now. Back to square one. Like, I'm fuck, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> all right, what's next? <laughs> it's, it's times, right? Like, I've, I've just been taking leaps. Like, taking leaps, failing. Taking leaps, failing. Like, taking leaps, that's not what I want to do. And it's cool, though, because it's back to square one. Okay, I tried this, tried this, tried this. Not working. Don't like this. Not fun. Not making money. And I just keep trying. But I'm glad I did it at, like, a really young age. And who knows? I mean, I'll probably, it's definitely not the last time I'm going to leap and fail. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I got a lot of the leaps and a lot of the fails out at an early age. Most people would be mid thirties, forties, fifties when they take a leap to start a restaurant and then they're fucked because they're, they have family, a mortgage, they lose everything. I had nothing, you know, I'm not, I mean, I have my girlfriend, but that's, which is, she's great. That's a lot, but I mean, it wasn't like I had like a financial obligation. Right. You didn't have any kids or anything. Yeah. So, you know, take, take a leap super, super young, which is, I'm glad I did. Um, Absolutely. And you got to keep doing it. You got to keep trying and if you fail, fail forward, just keep going. Fail, fail forward. Exactly. So the cool thing I learned out of all this though, is, you know, network and connections and your reputation. If you don't have a good reputation, then you're done. You know what I mean? Like it's tough to touch up regardless of if I failed or not, like my reputation has stayed the same and it's not, I never received, I don't think the reputation of, uh, this kid doesn't know what he's doing. This kid is an asshole. This kid doesn't have drive. This kid doesn't work hard. Like I've never, I don't yeah, think not screwing I, people over. Yeah. I don't screw people over. Like I've always had like an honest and been moral and like 
paid people on time. You know, I don't care like what the circumstance is, like you're getting paid. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I'm always, you know, put you guys first and make sure you guys are happy. But reputation is absolutely everything for sure. And so I took maybe a month or two off and a month or two off. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I'm at an apartment, you know, I'm paying, you know, a good chunk. I'm, I'm not doing anything. No, no income's coming in. Right. I'm like, okay, now what? And then I decide, I talked to this guy and he's like, yo, what, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, well, what are you good at? You're at the gym every day. And I'm like, yeah, but like, that's not going to make me anything. And so he's like, no, you should try it out. And so my vision is I've always been like an entrepreneur, I guess. I don't like saying I am, but it kind of just fell upon me. I've always like figured it out. I don't think I would ever go into a space and be like, yo, I'm going to work for this gym. I just couldn't physically do it. I don't see four bosses over my head saying like, oh, you have to train like this. You have to do it like this. You have to talk to people like this. Like that's just not, I know how to do that. And so I said to myself, like, I'm never going to work for a gym. And so I took on this one client. He was the CIO of Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, worldwide top 10 guys at Bed Bath & Beyond at the, at the time. And, you know, actually we still train him today, but I started training him and that was awesome. I had a bunch of buddies in the NFL. And so started training them. That was awesome. Are you even thinking like as a business yet or you're just kind of doing it? No, no, no. I'm just doing this to make some money and, you know, be happy. And it was awesome. I mean, I'm just, I'm training people 10 hours a week and making a good chunk of change, but only train 10 hours a week. I'm like, this is great. But like also helping people. And I'm like, these guys, like results are coming. I'm like, this is like addicting, you know, like yeah. I'm texting, like, make sure you're eating healthy, you know, make sure to do 200 sit-ups before you take a shower tonight. Like really, really in tune to people taking him out for drinks. It was good. And so that guy, um, Bobby, his name is, I bet Beth and Beyonce started training him, NFL players, another person in the building. Then I met this guy, Barry Sternlich, who I started training. He was maybe my fourth client, third or fourth. Met this other guy, Arthur. And is this, is this a lot of word of mouth? Or word of mouth. This- people saw my Instagram. People you know, heard I was training. People knew I was a former athlete. I think a lot of people knew my backstory in regards to I've been around fitness my whole life. I've done it. Mm-hmm. So it came very, very naturally to me. And so Barry Sternlich was, you know, one of the first and come to find out, you know, he's a CEO and founder of Starwood Capital. I want to say they manage over a hundred billion dollars in real estate. They're huge. Um, they founded the W. So go full circle. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I got a question for you. So a lot of people, they do personal training, you know, they're barely scraping by and it's almost like a chore to them. Here you are attracting high quality clients. You're loving what you're doing. How do you think you attracted these people and had so much fun with it? Because I wasn't begging people to train with me. I was just doing what I naturally do, posting what I wanted. And I never in one, at one time in the last two years have been like, Hey guys on Instagram or an email blast or whatever. It's only $99 a session this month. Yeah, you didn't discount yourself. I never discounted myself. I knew my worth. I knew my value. I knew bringing value, not only like physically to the client, meaning I knew how to work their body. I knew how to help them burn calories. I saw what vision they want to look like. And I knew how to help them with that. But also like mentally, like it's not just helping them physically, but it's also mentally. Like they have an hour out of their day to come work out with you and they want to forget about everything else in life. So I helped them do that. And I knew I could do that to people. So I never dropped my value. You know, I knew, I knew I was helping them out in that sense. You know, it was, it's almost like a therapy session, but I think what separates, I guess, me and my business of don't be a pig and our trainers compared to other trainers is the sense of hospitality and the sense of understanding your clients in a more in-depth way and training them in a little different way, not so generic. And talk about that because you do completely different work. Like when people think personal training, they're thinking standing in the mirror and doing a curl and like all weights and stuff like that. You don't do that. No. And so we go back to square one. I mean, just growing up, you know, around fitness my whole life, my grandfather was a professional bodybuilder. My father was, my mother competed in physique. My mother and father were both professional arm wrestlers. So I've learned ways to work out throughout from the ages of five until now I'm 26 that no one has seen. You can't learn it in a book. Yeah. You can't go to school and get a certificate to learn this. Shit. I've yeah. learned it Talk about 10,000 hours of, you know, 10,000 hours makes you, you know, perfect. You know, I have way more than that. And, mo- you know, and that's, I think what separates me as well is, you know, a lot of these trainers come in like, Oh, I want to become a personal trainer, which is cool. 
but they've never touched a weight or played a sport in their entire life. You know what I mean? So they go get a certificate and it doesn't do them justice. Yeah. You can give a biology class, you know, biology lesson during your workout, but if you don't actually understand the body and how it moves and the way it's supposed to move and, you know, mechanics, then you're only going to get so far. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I think athlete first, learn later. You're going to learn on the field. That's, it goes back to like learning in school or learning actually physically in a hedge fund and learning how to trade. You know, you're going to learn way more in a hedge fund when you're actually there and learning how to trade than you are in a classroom learning numbers. Absolutely. And you train professional athletes all the way down to stay at home moms. The spectrum of that you're training on is just all over the place. How does it work when somebody comes to you? Do they give you an initial goal and then you try to tailor it to make it work for them? There's a couple of different ways. So in regards to the females, you know, I learned the hard way, never ask for their weight. <laughs> so I never weigh the females coming in. I ask them, you know, if they want to tighten up in their clothes, if they want to get more flexible, if they, you know, if they want to try new maneuvers, whatever it is. So that's, that's one that's for the females, for the guys. Most of you guys come to me and like, dude, I want to look like you. I'm like, great. This is how we're going to do it. And so I put them on my training and on a program. Everyone's completely different. Everyone's genetic build is made up differently. So I might not have to work as hard as a guy with genetics, you know, differently, but in the same sense, it's just the way that you're, you're giving them the workouts and, and inspiring them to do the workouts. And, but it's all, it's all the same for the most part, you know, it's just pushing. Some people just have to push a little harder. Absolutely. And so you're posting videos of you doing flips and all these crazy workouts on Instagram. Can somebody that's not athletic, can they come to you and still get trained? And all the time, I would say only 10% of my clients are actually like former athletes or professional athletes. The rest are, you know, people that just want to be in shape. And my style of training, I want to say is a little different. It's yes, I have a hit component, you know, high intensity interval training. Yes, I have, you know, strength and conditioning, you know, we're doing a little bit of weights and body movement. But I've, like I said, I've taken movements that I've learned throughout my whole life. um, And ones I see and try out and test and use those with my clients. My initial mindset behind training, it all goes back to Mylan. You know what Mylan is? Mylan Chief? Yeah. 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 So it all goes back to that. And it, it goes back to developing Mylan. And so the reason that Brazil is so good at soccer, right? Yeah is because they play with wooden balls on a sand court. And it's from this book I read, and it really inspired me to train a certain way. And so I look at movements and training ways of getting of an in-depth training. So taking you out of your natural environment and giving you hard, depending on you know who you are and how far you've come in fitness, but hard challenges to do and different movements that you've never had. So I believe that if you do a more in-depth training, you're going to get faster results and better results and it's going to stick in your brain longer. So if you do a bench press and your feet are up and there's tension on your feet, you know, you're trying to hold your feet up and I'm pushing down, but you're doing a bench press. I see you're going to get better results, not only in your core and chest because you're doing a bench press, but it's, you're more in depth. It's in depth. Mm-hmm. It's, it's different. It's challenging you um, than a regular bench press. It might not be, you know, for everyone. It's not everyone's method, but I mean, I've seen it works for me and people like trying new. Absolutely. Not everyone just wants to do, you know, the natural leg press and the, you know, squats and, you know, the lunges and the curls. That's old news. It's all natural body movements. You're all using. natural body movements. Understand how the body actually works in an athletic position, in an athletic setting. And, and you're walking on the street, holy shit, almost get hit by a taxi. How you know, how are you going to move, you know, to save yourself? So that's my sense of training. It's not so much, let me curl as much as I can and squat as much as I can. Yeah, absolutely. So Dev, when did this become a business for you? I would say four months in. Four months in. It was quick. It was zero clients, you know, five, eight, 10 sessions a week to 20, 30, like within four months, 20, So 30. within four months, you're like, I got something here. Yeah, I got something here. I don't care when you want to train. I'm going to train. I'm going to get your shape. Like that was my mentality. Like if it's at 4 a.m. or 10 p.m. at night, I'll do a 12 hour day. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'll do a 14. I've done 15, 16 sessions in a day before. I don't care. It's just back to back, sip my water, have an apple and I'm I'm at it. You know, drink just like a football game. You eat some pasta the day before, right? Like I'm ready. I'm ready. 16 hours. I don't care. And so I think also what separates our company from others is the drive that all the trainers have. I know when I sense a trainer wants to just come in here and, you know, make a little money and, you know, train like five people a day, or if this mother is driven 
and he wants to come in here and do 15 hour days. He doesn't care. Dev, I'll drive up to Central Park. I'll go down to Financial District. I'll shoot over to Hoboken. I'll shoot over to Jersey City. Like, I don't care. Like, those guys are my gold. And those guys are the guys you have to keep in the company because they're willing to like go that extra mile that you can't teach that. Absolutely. And you're, you're embodying it too. It's not like you're telling all them to go everywhere and you're kind of chilling. You're, you're still in that mindset. Oh yeah. I, I got to work harder than everyone. I don't care. Like yeah. if he's doing nine sessions, I'll do 12 sessions. You know, yeah. if you're doing 12, I'm doing 13. I don't care. You know, I always want to be one step ahead and it's not, maybe it's a competitive edge of me, but it's just, um, I like it. I like it. It's like fun to me. It's fun being driven and doing different things. And Absolutely. And so Dev, you kind of did something uh, ingenious where your other company ties into exactly what you do. So now you're training these people and it's like, oh, do you need some nutrition in your life to help you maintain what you're trying to go for? How did the don't be a pig start? That happened about four months ago, maybe five months ago. And so we've been training. We've had the training business for the last you know, year, you know, trainers on board, running around you know, house to house, city to city, um, throughout New York, Hoboken, Jersey City. But one of the things we offered is because you know, it's, not, it's not cheap to train with us, right? So what we did was we offered you a meal as well per session. And so I would be you know, taking my bag around, taking the bands, and then I'd have like 10 meals in a bag and I'd give one to each customer throughout the day. Mm. Or I'd shoot back, you know, I'd have like a location where I'd shoot back to if it's, you know, my boy in New York, I'd hold them at his fridge or, you know, I'd hold them at my fridge, shoot back, make sure I always have nice fresh meals for them. But what, what I was coming to find out is in these meals, it just, I would just see like bad food or I didn't agree with it or, you know, the branding wasn't on point with what I thought. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I've been in the food industry. Mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. So that's why I put together the Don't Be a Pig meals. And we launched that four months ago, five months ago, the actual food portion of it. And we ran into like so many struggles. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh my God. It's, it was to a point where I'm just like, I'm not doing this anymore. What were some of the speed bumps you hit? Food going in, not being able to keep it cold while to the customer. It was really cool though, because I was able to test it with a high volume clientele already. So, you know, I bought a van. You know, we bought the LLC, we, you know, we own the copyright or whatever to it. You know, we set everything up. I'm a big believer in systems in place. I was going into Don't Be a Pig meal prep as I'm not going to be in the kitchen. The last time I was in the kitchen, me personally, was when I signed the lease for it. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't care, but it's not my expertise. So Absolutely. we've been in place there where I can check in, test the meals, you know, when they get delivered to my house as if I'm an actual customer and then we can make adjustments depending on that. So we started, you know, the hurdles ran into not being cold enough. You know, the food didn't come out right. There's too many ingredients to deal with. Our food costs were out the roof. You got people with food allergies and all that shit to that. Website wasn't working, glitches, food photos, everything you can imagine. The systems were tough to put in place, but now, now they're in place and it's much so easier. How did you manage it? You had to, you just had to kind of... So we got to a point where I said, all right, we're shutting it down. So I shut it down for two weeks and I said, we need to figure this food out and like square one from someone puts the order in to square a hundred until they physically have it in their mouth. Mm -hmm. Right? So from the time they purchase it till they take a bite of the food in their mouth, they need to be like, wow, that's good food. Right. And so we went through every step and the biggest problem was the food and how many ingredients we had. We had like, I might be exaggerating, but maybe like 100, 150 ingredients in like 12 meals. And mm -hmm. I'm like, we shouldn't like, that's just food cost 101. You know, yeah. we need to reuse. We can't have iceberg lettuce, kale, and spinach. It's right. one or the other. And then we're going to use it across the board for all the meals. It can't be brown rice, black rice, like same rice across the board. Right. right? It's meal prep. People aren't going to a gourmet restaurant. They mm -hmm. want to go to gourmet. They, you know, they go to, you know, the double eagle, you know, Del Frisco. They just want to eat healthy. They need a low calorie, most likely. If they want high calorie, they eat more of the meals. So we did that and it was a drastic change. Then we ran into issues with the sauces. The sauces are about how many ingredients go into a sauce. Yeah. Don't even think about. Don't even think about containers. How are we going to label? We have to have the nutrition, like a ton of stuff. But I think we've gotten it down. Um, we've gone through maybe 15 different food containers. Ones were leaking, ones would smell, ones would. You know, we wanted to go eco-friendly at first and use these wheat containers. Can't do that with food delivery because they break apart in the bags on delivery. Like they just don't hold up properly. So we had to go back to plastic, which it's all good. We're as eco-friendly as we can, but I guess the plastic's made out of corn. 
So that's okay. good. And how important is it to have an established team around you to help you with all this stuff? Like, do you have people at Don't Be a Pig that are just, that kind of help you guide you through all this like nonsense almost? For sure. You can only grow if you hire people better. And so that's why one of the first trainers we hired was Martin. And he's like one of the best boxing coaches ever. And he's still with us and he's rocking out and he's been with me since the beginning. But I wanted to get into boxing and like, okay, I'm going to be a boxing trainer. Mm-hmm. But like I started doing, I'm like, why am I doing this when we can use... That's Martin's specialty, yeah. An actual specialty. He's yeah. not doing strength and conditioning or the style of training I'm doing and I'm not doing, you know? Yeah, so like, absolutely. You have to find your expertise, you know, people. So, you know, we have John who's in the kitchen. He's, you know, a genius with food and recipes and food costs and everything. So he's handling that. And then we have our office manager who's unbelievable with numbers and, you know, being on top of whether it's 4 a.m. in the morning or 10 p.m., like she's answering stuff. We have our graphic designer who's like, it's really cool to like talk about a graphic designer, right? Like, do you want a graphic designer who just like, Oh, I want to be creative and I want to be a graphic designer or one who actually physically hangs out with like a bunch of artsy people. And mm-hmm. like, she looks around it and like, she looks at brands like, Ooh, like make sure it's on brand to this. And like, Oh, it's this- constantly on her mind. On she knows her how mind. her mind works. Yeah. Like, I can teach someone that, you know, like no one can teach someone if they physically love to do design. And so putting people in place that are really good at what they do is super key. Yeah. And so systems in place are key. So that has elevated into an entire wellness company now. So not only are you doing the meal preps, what else are you guys doing? So we put systems in place. You got to be ready for an opportunity rather than not ready for an opportunity, right? Like if someone approaches you and they're like, Oh, I want you to do this. And you're like, I don't know if I can do that. Or someone approaches you like, Oh, I want you to this. Be like, no problem. I'd rather spend the money early on and be like, cool. My systems are in place for the world. If the world wants to train with us right now, we're ready for that. Right. Yeah. And so the system in place. So we, we're doing a couple of residential buildings in Jersey, New York, but then we've just recently partnered with, you know, the one hotels, which is really cool. So we're going to be doing their wellness program and, uh, you know, offering, uh, you know, one-on-one training to them. So it's kind of a turnkey operation. They, you know, it's, it's tough for a company to just do that. You have to look at all the things I've just gone through, you know, in the last couple of years, just to build this, there's no company out there, a hotel or whatever, that's going to be able to, turnkey. Okay. Here's wellness. We can do it ourselves. You have to outsource it. So we've got that covered for them and we're about to rock out. We're going to do like a hard launch in March. So beautiful. And Dev, where can people find you online and all the don't be a pig stuff? Just on the, my Instagram and then the Devin LeVake at Devin LeVake and then the food and wellness and training one-on-one training. They can go to don't be a pig.co. Co. Perfect. Yeah. And Dev, at the end of every show, I'd like to ask, what is one piece of advice that has really resonated with you over the years that you would like to gift the audience? Could be absolutely anything. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Straight up. Don't yeah, do it. Don't do it. All right, Dev. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'd love to have you back on anytime, man. Yeah, for sure, man. I, thanks for uh, picking my brain. I know it went by fast, but that was good. Absolutely. All right, brother. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, subscribe, give us five stars, and leave a review. It really helps boost the podcast and spread the good word. My chiropractic practice is located in West Orange, New Jersey, at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. You can also find us on Facebook at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. All of my information is on my website at drkevinpecka.com, drkevinpecka.com. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka for podcast episodes, patient testimonials, and educational videos. I have daily affirmations and inspirational quotes on Instagram at Easel Affirmations, E-A-S-E-L Affirmations. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at drkevinpekka at gmail.com, drkevinpekka at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Cheers.